tonight and we are indeed celebrating Mother's Day today and women in general. We want to welcome our online campus and our deaf ministry as well. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. Uh, we all come to motherhood with different perspectives and motherhood um, affects each one of us differently. I remember the first few days being a mom. 19 years ago, I had a newborn daughter and with, um, in a couple of hours of being home with her by myself, I convinced myself that she was choking. And I completely panicked. I ran across the um, yard, a snow-covered yard, to get to my neighbor's house. I was in my pajamas and barefoot, and I had her with me, and I went pounding on my neighbor's door because she ran a daycare in her home. And all I could think of was, get the baby to Audrey. And her teenage son opened the door, and I scared him half to death. I thrust my crying infant at him. I'm crying. Um, it was a good day. Uh, my husband came home and he was like, you cannot do this for the next 18 years. So I've gotten a little bit better. She's 19 now. I'm a little bit calmer. Now she wears slippers. Yeah, I wear slippers when I go running and, um, you know, screaming through the neighborhood. I, I do credit the women and men in this church for coming alongside me um, all, throughout the years of my parenting journey and sharing their wisdom and their insight and their experience with me. Uh, I think of Galatians 6 2, which reminds us, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And I believe that Southside Church is a beautiful picture of that actually in action. So I'm very grateful for the women that have come alongside me over the years. And it's in that spirit and in celebration of Mother's Day that we thought we would invite a few of our ladies from Southside who love Jesus and have learned a thing or two along the way to just share some of their insight and their wisdom with us. So let's, let's, let's just jump right in. I want to introduce our panel to you. Uh, we have Elizabeth Aguist. Doctor. Elizabeth, she is Dr. Elizabeth Doctor. Aguis. Now she graduated yesterday from William and Mary. Yep. Um, Dr. Aguis <laughs> and Freddie, her husband, uh, they have two girls who are college age, and actually Janelle, your oldest, just graduated just from started. college yesterday. Yes. So she's in that young adult period, um, navigating the, that territory, so I cling to Elizabeth quite a bit. Uh, we also have Emily Woodworth. Emily and her husband Mark have five kids who are still in elementary school, and actually your oldest, Hayden, just finished his First, is finishing his first year of middle school. So they are right in the middle of that child rearing chaos and joy. Um, and then uh, to round us out, we have Robin Harper. Robin and her husband Steve have two teenage boys, which enough said right there, right there. Everyone clap for Robin. Um, we, Robin has a <laughs> <laughs> Robin has a middle school and a high school um, child right now, so they are smack dab in the middle of the teenage years. So I think we're pretty well-rounded here, and we've got um, some great um, insight and wisdom that we would love to share with everybody. So first question, um, first topic that we wanted to deal with was something that I think man, woman, mother, not a mother, um, you can deal with or you can relate to, failure, feelings of failure. I was sharing with them earlier about a colossal parenting failure that I experienced when my kids were younger. I had gotten some advice from a parenting book about removing children who are fighting from the family situation. And when they had resolved their conflict, then they would be allowed to come back into the family situation. And this worked great. I, my kids would start fighting. <laughs> Samantha's face. My daughter is laughing on the front row right now. Uh, this worked wonderfully because I started started it in the winter. So when they were little, I would stick them outside if they were fighting, and they, their argument ended so quickly. They'd come right back in, done, we're done. Um, and then spring rolled around. Uh, we went to a, an all-day outing with some friends, and at the end of the day, we went out to eat, and they, they get into it because they're tired and hungry, and we sent them outside of the restaurant. We were seated right by a window so I could see them on the sidewalk, and when I turned to look, they had each other by the hair, they were pummeling each other out in the parking lot for everyone to enjoy, and all I could do was yell for my husband to go turn a hose on them and, and pull them apart. So huge failure on my part, didn't see that one coming. And I think, you know, we've all experienced failures. Some of them are funny like that, but some of them are not so funny, and, and they can actually be 
devastating. Um, Robin, what, what would you say to women who feel like they have experienced a huge fail, or maybe they just feel like they're failing over and over again? Sure. So I did an informal poll and discovered that we all fail. It's pretty impressive, like we're all in the same boat here. And so my first advice is just breathe. Just breathe. Give yourself some grace here. So I, I love to read the Bible. I mean, I think that's probably a good thing for you guys to know. And um, there's some people in the Bible that I love who you would not consider to be you know, upright. Like if they were living in today's time, you might have some issues with them. And one of them is Rahab. And it's in the book of Joshua if you want to read it. And so you look at Rahab, and Rahab had a job that um, boys wouldn't want to bring her home to mama. <laughs> You with me? Okay. So you look at Rahab, and Rahab was the one who helped the spies come in, and they helped, she helped to protect them so they could, you know, check out the area, and then she was protected, and that was with the Battle of Jericho. Okay. So you read in the Bible, and you go on down the line, and Rahab was the mother of Boaz. Stick with me here. You read in the book of Ruth, you'll read about Boaz. So Naomi had gone off to um, Moab with her husband and her boys, and her husband dies and her boys get married and they have wives, and they, the boys die as well. So Naomi is coming back and she's got these two daughters-in-law with her. One of them goes back to her country, but Ruth stays with her. Ruth, the, the kinsman redeemer of her family was Boaz. So Ruth and Boaz get married. Now, what does this have to do with anything? This is in the lineage of Jesus. When I think of Jesus, and I think if I were in charge of who would be his ancestors, these would be squeaky clean, perfect people, and they're not. And it's not just Rahab, it's not just Ruth, who was not even an Israelite, she was a Moabite, she was an outsider. These are the people in Jesus' line of family history. And I look at that and say, if God can use them, he can use me with my failures. Right. Oh, that really speaks to me um, when I hear about somebody else failing, um, like I have heard many times in small groups here at Southside Church. I think that my failure is my fear of failure and my expectations versus God's expectations of me and balancing that and knowing that God's expectations for me are far different, that he loves me regardless of circumstances, regardless of how many times that I fail. Um, if you think of our, I, I love this song, Masterpiece. I don't know if you've ever heard it. He's making a masterpiece of us. And if I think of it in that way, we are, God's creating us and he's, you know, he's not making any mistakes. We're making mistakes, but he, we may not see the bigger picture, the bigger painting, yeah. but he does. Okay. He sees the yeah. end. Let me tell you something. I was looking at that last night, and I was looking at 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see, uh, perfect. Now we see in a mirror darkly and dimly, but then face to face. And the commentary was saying that back then, when Paul was speaking to the church at Corinth, that was their trade, making mirrors. But they made mirrors of polished metal, so you could it's not like the mirrors we think of today. So we think, now you see darkly in a mirror, how does it happen? They had polished metal, so when they looked, it was just a very vague, indistinct form. And God is saying to us, look, you don't see the big picture. What is happening in your life right now may seem like a failure to you, but you don't see the big picture. You may see it darkly, you may see it dimly, it may be indistinct, but I have a master plan, going exactly to what you said. And I kept thinking of that. We think of, so I, I thought of it, okay, so what is failure, what is success? Um, King David, when he was about to die, he gave his son Solomon the following advice. Do what the Lord your God commands and follow his teachings. Obey the law of Moses. Then you will be a success no matter what you do or where you go. Love God, obey God. And if you're doing that, that is success. Mm -hmm. Everything else is what the world defines as success. So don't use the world's standards. Use God's standards. If you love God and you obey him, he will guide you. My mom has a saying, every mess is a message, every test is a testimony. I love that, I grew up hearing that. 
If every mess is a message, she always says, when you mess up, you know it's okay. If you're loving God and obeying God, we all fail. Mm -hmm. You all do things that you, know, you think, oh, this could have been better or whatever. It's a message that you can share with somebody else. Every test is a testimony. If you are tested, if something in your life is not what you think is successful, it may just be God's test so that you can testify to somebody else, mm -hmm. to help somebody else. And I think of God's logic. So we think, we have the world standards, we have God's standards. God has defined success for us. God's logic is not the world's logic. It is the exact opposite. I started tracking it in my Bible. Every time I read something that was the opposite, I would write it down. So for example, Matthew 16, 24. If you save your life, you lose it. If you lose your life, you'll find it. Matthew 18, 4. The humble would be made proud, the proud brought to destruction. Matthew 20, 16. The first would be last, the last would, you get what I'm saying? The flip. Right? So we think of the world has tried to mold us into what we should define success and failure as. And God is like, please, 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 what the world's logic says, mine is the flip side of that. Right? If somebody stri strikes you on one cheek, mm -hmm. turn the other cheek, who does that? Nobody does that. But God is saying, that is my logic. So I think those messages have really helped me figure out I can't judge my life, what do you say by Facebook? I can't judge my life by anybody else's standards. Mm -hmm. I have to use God's standards, and God says, love me, obey me, and that is success. Mm -hmm. So everything else kind of, we learn. Yeah. You learn from and it. You, and like you were talking about Rahab and um, Ruth, the world looked at them, and they put these unrealistic like expectations, expectations on them that Emily is referring to, and God's looking at it from a totally different perspective. He flips yeah. the script every time. He flips the script. I like that. <laughs> Take notes. Okay, wonderful. Um, the next subject that we wanted to address was, um, Elizabeth, how about, how about you start us off on this one? Sure. If you could go back in time and talk to the Elizabeth of, say, 10, 15 years ago, what would you say to her? Do you know why they chose me for this one? Because <laughs> I have 10, 15 years behind me. I'm the oldest one on the panel. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I think of, so this is not like scriptural, really. I mean, it's just kind of like me talking as a female. So if 10 to 15 years ago, I had a lot of dreams, a lot of aspirations. And when I got married, God really laid it in my heart. And I'm not saying this is for everyone. This was just God's plan for me. God laid it on my heart to kind of put those aside, to just think of being mom. And uh, I had just finished up my master's degree, and I thought, I really want to go forward and do my PhD. And it just didn't happen. And the timing wasn't right. It didn't work right. And I always felt, well, God, you know, I love my kids, and this is a perfect example of what your plan for my life could be, that I can follow your path. And you think of, I mean, so many of us in this congregation this morning, in this audience, would think, well, I've put stuff on the back burner for taking care of elderly parents. Or I've put stuff on the back burner because, and you can fill in the blank with whatever the because is. And as females, sometimes we are service leaders, so we serve. I mean, that's just kind of our makeup. And uh, the, the me of 10 to 15 years past, would have thought, it's okay, I love my kids, I love that God has given me this opportunity to be a mom, and to, to have the opportunity to actually stay home and be a stay-at-home mom when they were growing up, and then get back into the workforce. But this dream of earning a PhD was something I just literally put aside. And 20 years later, I walked across a stage yesterday and earned my PhD. <laughs> and God, I, I can, please, find me and ask how God opened door after door after door to make this dream a reality for me. So I think the me of 15 to 20 years ago was stressing a little bit about the fact that as a female, I was giving up some things. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was earn, like gaining a lot, but I didn't know that God will make com come full circle mm -hmm. and give it back to me. And that's the kind of God I serve. Yeah, I, love <laughs> I love that you say that, coming full circle. Because when I left college, my dream was to just have children. So that was it. That was my big picture, like, going to have children. And I went all in, you know, all in, doing everything for them. Um, kind of the helicopter mom, I have to admit. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, 
But something happened here when we moved to Southside, when we moved to Richmond and I came to Southside and I was asked by Juliana Moore to fill out an application for Sunday school and to be a Sunday school teacher. And it surprised me that the questions on it were all about me. And it was, what is your favorite thing to do? What brings you joy? How do you feel you can best um, serve the Lord with your gifts and talents? And I went, gifts and talents? I, I don't know if I have any gifts and talents. Lord, what do I even like to do? It's sort of the opposite of what you said. Mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't have that long term, like I want to have an occupation. So maybe some of you are in that same boat where you, you know, came and were, are doing something and then that season is sort of ending. So my season of childbearing ended and I was in this position of, oh, who am I? What next? And God came full circle. Full circle. And, and really shared and showed me um, who I am. And then if we are serving, using the gifts and talents that God has given us, then uh, we're bringing glory to God. Right. And then we have joy. Awesome. Awesome. Robin, how about you? So 15 years ago was actually when Steve and I walked into the doors of Southside Church. I can't believe we've been here 15 years. And to be honest, I thought God had stopped listening to me. Um, when Steve was called into ministry, um, we were in Kansas City, and God gave me Hebrews 11, you know, talking about Abraham going out to a place he didn't know and how fantastic that was going to be. And so we went from Kansas City to California, and I was like, yes, this is the best. And then over the next six years, we had been in three churches, and it was, it was rough. And so when we came here, I was like, God, do you, do you even care? Are you even listening to me? I've asked you. You know, I believed that you wanted us to go into ministry. I believed you had a plan for us. And so when we walked in the doors here, I was like, all right, you know, maybe we'll just be here a couple years and off we go. And, and I'd ask God, can we at least have five years? You know, that'd be kind of nice. And here we are 15 years later. And so I can look back and I would tell the 15 years ago me, God has not forgotten you. He hasn't abandoned you. He's listening to you. And guess what? Everything you've prayed for and asked for, he's going to give you right here at Southside. I asked for a fantastic church to be a part of. You guys are fantastic people to get to do life with. You have loved my children. You have loved me. You have walked with me through so many different highs and lows. And um, you have been the people that my children have looked to. We had an issue with Austin a few weeks ago. And he and I were going round and round. And we were not getting a resolution on it. And I just knew I was right. And um, well, Of course you are. Of course I was. Of course I was. And so I said, and I knew Steve was exactly on the same place that I was. So I said, all right, Austin, pick three people, only three, three people that you would choose to speak into this. And he chose three men from this church. And they, they gave me advice that I needed to hear. And, um, and it was so, I was so thankful that God has allowed us to be here 15 years to get to let my kids grow up here and to be a part of this. And I benefited from Robin with my daughters. Um, Janelle, my eldest, who graduated yesterday, was in Robin's small group from sixth grade all the way until she left the college. Robin just you know, went with the group. And Robin has been a source of when she needed advice, when she wanted somebody to talk to, um, and somebody that she loved, truly, truly loved. I think of Susie Foldenauer who I know many of you all in the audience are going, yes, because <laughs> she has mentored so many of us. Um, so for our kids, we have that small group, you know, that connection, the, the people here really pour into our kids. But then for me as a mom, I'd go to Susie. She has older kids than I do, and I'll go to Susie and say, okay, I'm thinking about doing this, what do you think? And she's like, no, 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 stop right there. <laughs> Exactly like that. We needed a so, seatbelt for Elizabeth when, she, when she's in her chair. But it's just the, the godly advice. Um, I was looking online and asked, seeing what is a successful mom? And they had this list of things. Because I was going to be, yeah, they're saying this is success, and God says this. But it's like, they were really biblical principles. And one of them was, um, don't be afraid to reach out. And when it, I think of reaching out, it's not, I think for me, it has been not so much the age of the person I'm reaching out to, but the stage of life they're in. 
I've looked at people that have probably been, you know, like are a little ahead of me and can kind of speak back and say, these are the mistakes I made, don't do that. And my, my sister was telling me this um, actually yesterday, and which was pretty neat. She said, I know tomorrow is Mother's Day and I want you to know that I came to you for advice and she's younger than I am. And she said, I would ask you things or you would say to me, you were never afraid to be transparent. You were never afraid to show that you're not perfect. So I would be like, oh my gosh, right now I feel so fat. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like just regular stuff that we go through as females. Or right now, you know, I would feel like a failure. Or I feel like if I'm doing this wrong or this wrong. And she said, and I would listen and say, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'll make sure my kids don't do this. I'll make, because she was learning from me. And I had people in this church that I was learning from. And I had people from the church that were pouring into my kids that they were able to look to. So I think it's that, again, that full... The body of Christ, we talked about that last week in our service, the body of Christ, we all play a part. And men stepping up for boys, females stepping up for girls, um, parents stepping up for each other. I think that is so important. You guys are full of good stuff. All I would have said to me 10 years ago is chill out. You <laughs> take a breath already. But that was good stuff. <laughs> Um, let's move on to another subject, and maybe Emily, you can start us off with this one. Um, what's an area, Emily, that you felt particularly passionate about regarding preparing your children for life? Like, if I can just sort of cram one thing into their brains, uh, this would be it. It's a tough question <laughs> to say. I think um, Mark and I make a partnership in this but this can speak to anyone at any stage in life, single moms, um, mm -hmm. grandparents raising um, their grandchildren. Sometimes that's a, a case. Right. And we sort of put a mission in the heart of our, ourselves as we begin to raise our home. And it's from Deuteronomy uh, 6, 5 through 9. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, which we've heard many times. And then it says, and these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And as we all know, we yell at our kids. We yell at our spouse. We yell at our coworkers. We do all of these things. And for me... Um, to prepare my kids for life or to pe prepare, um, you know, our household. It's really about taking opportunities where conflict happens, where we usually take, when there's a conflict, we say, oh, no, this is terrible. I have a terrible home. That, again, that fear of failure. And we, we think that we are, nobody else is going through what we're going through. And what I like to think of it as, or at least I try to remind myself in the moment when there's a conflict, is this conflict is an opportunity, mm -hmm. an opportunity for God to move in, mm -hmm. an opportunity for um, us as parents, us as um, single moms, as grandparents, to step in and show what God's perspective is. And so in order for us to do that, we need to be in the, in the Word of God ourselves. And when we do that and we're sharing those stories with our children, we can use biblical words to speak into that conflict. Yeah. So we're speaking about peace, patience, kindness. When, that, when, when we're not being patient, I might talk about how I have struggled with patience, what the Lord says about patience, what the stories of the Bible say about patience. And does it take a heck of a lot more time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a lot easier to, um, to just yell at them and tell them the right thing to do. And when we share biblical stories and insert God's um, word into that, that's sort of what I would say mm -hmm. is most important for just preparing for them for the future because I want them to go out in the world and know how to solve conflicts. Right. And I want right. them to use God's word to solve conflicts. Right. Really trying to prepare children to become adults that don't need you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Robin, what, what was something that you felt passionate about preparing your kids for life? So... Um, there have been women in this church who have had such wisdom, who have raised kids before me. Like, working in youth ministry, um, to be honest, Steve and I had been around kids so long, and teenagers, I was like, ah, I got it, no big deal. <laughs> it's another thing when they're in your house. And so, um, 
part of it, and I don't really know what to call it, so this is my own little title for it, and it may be right or wrong, but I call it the balance of power. And so let me explain. When Austin was a baby, I made every decision for him. I made a decision what he was going to wear, when his diaper was changed, what he was going to eat. I made every decision for him. Now, he made a little bit like if he was actually going to go to sleep when I put him to, <laughs> down for a nap, but, but you get it for the most part. And then um, as he got older, he got to make a little bit more decisions, actually both of the boys. And some of them were ones that I was like, all right, what do you want to wear today? And um, my children have shown up to church in plaid shorts with a different plaid shirt with bright orange socks, and I'm like, whatever, they're gonna wear it. Yeah, we can always tell when you're empowering your children yes. to learn how to dress. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and they also would love to wear their costumes to church, so we'd have Spider-Man and Batman and whatever show up. Okay, fine, what, you know, it was, let them have their thing. You know, haircuts over the years. They look at me and they're like, Mom, why did you let me have my hair like that? Well, You insisted. Yeah, exactly. But, um, as he's gotten older, Austin is now 17, <laughs> and um, I'm holding on for dear life here because this is, I, I'm now at the point of, is he ready? Have I taught him everything? Does he know? Can he make wise decisions on his own? Can I, can I let him go into a situation that I may question, but can I let him go and let him make the decision, giving him all the tools that I know how, okay, if you see this, that, or the other thing, maybe you should get out of there, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Because in one year, he graduates high school. Right. I will be, you know, a blubbery mom. You guys can all, you know, <laughs> bring me tissues that day. But um, he's going to have to make all of his decisions. Now I know as kids get older and such that they, come, they still come back to mom for advice. I did that to mom a lot. But... It's the giving them age appropriate decisions on their own and not clinging on to everything. Because I am a, I'm a control freak and I want to make sure things go just as planned. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure my kids are making the best choices, whatever. But sometimes I have to let them do it on their own and they have to fail to learn the lesson. Yeah, those role changes can be hard. I really yeah. think all of us want to just hear good job. Well done. I know I do. And I think I rem I'm reminded of the song Control. And it says that God is um, beyond, behind and before you. Um, he's there to redeem and restore. So he says, good job. Well done. Right. Good and faithful servant. And he loves us just where we are. And he's judging Absolutely. it by his standards, That's not right. the world's standards. Right. But well right. done. Um, I think for me, it has been, I have two girls. So for me specifically, it was making sure that I had them understand how to live a sexually responsible and pure life. That was just very important to me. Um, and I think it started when they were very young. That it was something my parents did an excellent job with, with making me understand. I remember my dad bought um, Love Must Be Tough for me. I think I was like 11 or 12, and he's like, read this book. It's an excellent book because it will teach you what you should allow, how you should allow people to treat you. But he was thinking of it also from a female male perspective mm -hmm. that love does not mean that you're a doormat. Love, you know, just the, the basic things that I think a female really needs to understand. Um, so for me, it was from the time they were young, the scripture has been, I guess, a really good guide for me. Jeremiah 1 5. I knew you before you. I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And I talked to my kids about the fact that before you were even born, God has a plan for you, God formed you, that there is a, you should respect yourself, understand how unique and powerful you are as a female, that God made you to be this way. Um, and I praise them a lot. I think verbal praise goes a long way because we were able to, I, I think as a mom, I would always say, oh, you look beautiful today. Or what you did was such a kind act so that they, it, it built them up mm -hmm. so that they didn't feel t torn down. I was looking at a study. Um, it was done by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. They had, um, they looked at data from girls, first, I'm sorry, not girls, students, girls and boys first grade to age 15, and they, can, they took data six times during that time frame, 
they had uh, close to 1,400 participants, and they found that the increase in father-adolescent conflict and the increase in mother-adolescent conflict it increased the risk of sexual activity before the age of 15, when that was happening in the home. We'll go, duh, we get that, right? What they found was, however, so I'm gonna speak specifically to the men, a rapid decline in father-adolescent closeness. So not just the conflict, that's kind of the negative. The positive, and this was not true for the mother so much, it was the father-adolescent closeness was really a huge factor in how, at the age at which kids became sexually active. And Freddie has been excellent in that regard, where he has, so we partner with this, and he is the model of what they should expect from a man, how they should expect to be treated, how they should be respected. So I think when it came to the, the sexual responsibility and sexual purity, it was more up about respect. God has made you to be all this and to and make sure they understood that. And then from the home, look how my husband respects me. So the, the two parts of that, I think, laid the groundwork so that when they went off to college, I remember walking into the dorm. So this is how clueless I was. Walking into the dorm to drop my child off to college and for the first time realizing it was co-ed. It's like, they allow this in America? What in the world? <laughs> and I thought, okay, Jesus, I'm freaking out now. But I, I, I think I, I understood that really it's up to my kids, right? We can't make those decisions for them. All we could do is lay that groundwork. Mm -hmm. And I really, because I think, again, dads, my dad gave me that book from a very young age to tell me I was a powerful female. I should respect myself. This is how I should be treated. And he modeled that with my mom. My husband modeled it with me. So my kids, I was able to say, God, I rest in the training that you put in my heart to give to them. Mm -hmm. I rest in their relationship. They had people like Robin that would speak into their lives from another perspective, not just from a mommy perspective. She was in your small group for how many years? I trusted Robin with my child. When Janelle graduated, I sent her, I was like, we did this. It was a partnership. So I think all that groundwork was there. So you were like, okay, I can trust them. I trust mm -hmm. that God will take care of them and can relax in that. And you touched on, it's such a beautiful picture um, of some of the other things that you ladies have shared about the body of Christ coming around Absolutely. your families. Absolutely. And Emily, you had mentioned earlier, you know, single parents and grandparents are navigating these issues um, in, in even tougher context. And that's where I see the men and women of this church um, ready, willing, and able yes. to step into some areas where if you don't have, you know, if there's not a mother in the home, if there's not a father in the home, that there are adults that want to come and speak yes. into the lives of your children and be that Christ-like example for them. And Pastor Wynn said yeah. last week, show up. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah. Don't expect people to know that you need help. If you show up, and ask, we have people in this church that will pour love into you. I mean, all of us have, it's not random that all of us can have these experiences. We showed up and we knocked on doors and said, I need your help. You went, you know, you asked your son and then you went to the man and they poured into him. I go to Susie and I pour into her and she pours into me. So it's just, if you show up, you show up. We have so many people. This is the I think the, the beauty of our church, that there are small groups where people will pour into your life. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Very much so. Well, ladies, thank you so much um, for your time and your wisdom and your, I, I've been making mental notes of some of the things that you said even now. I'm still in the middle of, you know, um, navigating parenting issues myself. Um, so I hope that uh, you all listening have come away with a couple of things today. One, just the, that the burden of perfection would mm. be lifted from you and to know right. that everyone struggles. experiences struggles yes. and that life it gets messy for everyone. And that's okay because God can handle messy.
and he will step in and walk through those issues with you when life kind of gets ugly or difficult sometimes and you're not the only one experiencing that. I also hope that you came away with a sense of how important it is, and I think we probably beat this drum over and over, how important it is to be a part of the body of Christ, to benefit from the many people here that um, you can gain wisdom and, and experience from. Um, earlier when we were talking, we, uh, we talked about a verse, Romans 1.12, which we're going to put up on the screen for you. Uh, and, and Paul's talking to his readers, and he's telling them, you know, you need to be with each other, meeting with each other, so that you can be mutually encouraged by each other's faith mutually encouraged by each other's faith. And Emily, you had mentioned at one point that you have to show up. And, and you've, Elizabeth, you said this too, you have to show up in order to have the, the um, intimate, real, authentic relationships that allow you to glean information from people and allow you that vulnerability and that comfortableness to go to people and say, I'm having this struggle. I'm having this struggle in my marriage or my job or with parenting. You know, I need, I need some help with this. And uh, we talked about being um, face to face instead of Facebook. You, you'd mentioned <laughs> Facebook as well. And doing life face to face mm -hmm. and, and actually showing up and being a part of a group or a ministry or something. Um, so th that, that would be our challenge as we, as we get ready to um, pray and, and close out, is we want you to be a part of what is going on um, within this family at Southside Church. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. One of those would be to, to join a small group. I've heard small group mentioned by all three of you. Um, become a part of a small group, and there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different groups that you can be, be a part of. Um, there's a lot of ladies groups that meet on Wednesday nights. There's a brand new men's group that just started. Um, ladies, if you're raising a son on your own, this, this men's group would be very beneficial. We've got men that are bringing um, young men and teenage boys along with them to do outdoor stuff and teach them things. Uh, so, and, and if you don't find a small group that you think would speak to you, start one. We, we would love to help you start a small group. We're all about creating more places for people to have community here at Southside. Um, another way that you can f show up and be face-to-face -face is to find a ministry. Uh, I, I found um, one of my best friends by entering into preschool ministry about 15 years ago. And oddly enough, we made a lot of friends when we volunteered in a neighborhood Bible club, mm -hmm. and those are coming up, um, Pastor Mike didn't even ask me to plug that. I just knew that neighborhood Bible clubs is where we met a lot of people, and we had so much fun one year, the next year we went and signed up at a different club so, because we figured we would meet more people. So finding a ministry is a great way for you to do life face-to-face -face with people. And last but not least, uh, I've heard the word mentor mentioned as well. And Find that Christ-filled person yes. and ask them, you know, to mentor you, become a part of their lives. If you are that Christ-filled person, pour into other people, be that Christ-filled mentor for someone else. I always think of the image of my hand, you know, in somebody else's where they're helping me along and then I turn around and I grab somebody else's hand and I'm pulling them along. And that, I think, is a picture of discipleship that Jesus outlined for us. Um, Emily, how about you pray for us today? Lord God, we are just so grateful. You have given us so much. You have blessed us abundantly. And I thank you for showing up. You are always there. You go behind us and before us. And you love us completely, regardless of our failures. Lord, show us in ways that we can connect with people, that we can connect with our neighbors, other friends, people here at Southside, people in our communities, Lord. Help us to love God and love people. Lord, help us to know that the truth of your word will set us free. Right. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.
All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this has been beneficial for you today. We're going to go ahead and dismiss you. Before we do that, I want to remind you that Table Talk is on its way to your inbox, and we're going to discuss a little bit more about the topics that we talked about today. If you don't get Table Talk, please email um, Southside Church and tell them, I want Table Talk, and we will get that to you. And ladies, uh, whether you're a mom or not, we want to celebrate you, so there is a gift for you as you leave today. Um, just a little something to tell you that we love you and we appreciate you. So have a wonderful afternoon and have fun doing battle in the restaurants today. You are dismissed. <laughs>